Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you today? Good. Are you doing well? Would you stand up? Would you stand up in your classrooms and worship the Lord with us? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love. to introduce a new song to you this morning, and it's called I Am Loved. And it talks about how, um, you know, we make mistakes sometimes. How many of you make mistakes? How many of you have already made a mistake this morning? I have. And it talks about even though we make mistakes and we make wrong choices, and sometimes we make mistakes on purpose, we know what we're doing is wrong, that when God looks at us, he's not disappointed in us. Um, he loves us so very much, and um, he wants to take away our guilt and take away our shame if we just call on him and ask for uh, forgiveness. So this is called I Am Loved. Just as I am, you welcome me. With open arms, how can this be? My guilt is undone, my past is untethered. I leave it behind and run to my Father. disappointment in your eyes. There is no shame, there is only pride. I am loved, Father, I'm loved. 
thank you so much. Would you take a seat, please? Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all doing? Good. I'm sorry that you did not have your coffee yet this morning. You look a little tired. You ready for spring break? See, that's coffee to your heart. Mine too. I am too. Um, and guys, at this point in the year, we really are ready for that break. But it is my hope and prayer too, though, that as we are thinking about that, really around this time of year, we're celebrating Easter. So we're getting ready to do that. And guys, that is when the greatest act of love um, we were given because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We had done nothing good enough to earn it. It was just because of his love and because he wants a relationship with you. And my biggest prayer for you guys always, always, always is that you will understand the life-changing love that God has for you, that you will understand truly how loved you are, not just like, oh, yeah, he's a great kid or she's a great kid, but that you are loved so with perfect, perfect love um, by our Heavenly Father. This morning, I'm so excited we are having um, Mrs. Belford is going to come, and she's going to share with us this morning. Um, her husband is the pastor at Colonial Baptist Church. She does lots of things around here from being a mom to helping coach um, some things, and she just loves the Lord, and I think she has always, whenever she comes to share, always has... Um, practical advice for our lives and how we live them in a way that honors God. So I made sure to bring my notebook today. I hope if you have yours, you will um, take notes with the encouragement that she has to share. And um, as she's coming, will you guys join me as we pray for her? God, I thank you so much uh, for this morning. I thank you that we get to start our day today by worshiping you. And Lord, I just pray that you will work in our hearts and our minds, Lord, just to understand how loved we are and how much we matter. Lord, I thank you for Miss Belford. I thank you for her love for you and how she pours into people. And uh, God, I just pray that you will use her words in a special way this morning. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. How are you all doing today? I'm happy to see you. I recognize some of you. You might be happy to see me because, can you all hear me? Is this good? Good, because I want you to stay awake. I only have 15 minutes. Um, so I brought some peeps with me. How many of you like peeps? Really? How many of you don't? Cool. Levi doesn't. I asked him on the way to school today. I'm like, hey, I'm bringing peeps for a prize today. He goes, I hate peeps. I hate marshmallows. I thought everybody liked these things. All right, so I'm going to ask you guys a question in a little while, and if you like peeps, or even if you don't, um, you will get a prize. I will throw them. I will throw it to you. I got two prizes, so, and I like to throw things. All right, today we are going to talk about identity. Has anybody ever heard the word identity before? What do you think about when you think of the word identity? Yeah, someone's name, who they are, what you look like, yep, a description of someone, absolutely. Um, the dictionary says that it is who you are, the way you think about yourself, the way you're viewed by the world, your personality, your looks and expressions make up a person, and they're unique to you, so you have an identity. If you were applying for a job right now, if you were old enough, and they said, uh, we need to see some identity, do you know that they would probably ask for, what do you think, your driver's license, your ID card, what else? What do you got? like your driver's license, a passport, um, your social security number. You all have a social security number that is unique to you. And then you also have a fingerprint. I have identical twins, and they can actually open up each other's phones with just their face. face. They can open it up with face recognition, but they cannot open up each other's phone with their thumbprint. They have a unique fingerprint that is unique to them. That's their identity, something about them that is unique. 
But what enters your mind specifically when somebody says, who are you? By what or by whom do you define yourself? Identity questions are those like, um, you know, I like this. I'm in fourth grade. I'm in fifth grade. I'm in sixth grade. I play, how many of you play football? Or basketball? Or volleyball? Or you swim? Or you're in, you know, the play? These are things that you like, things that you do. These define you, your favorite foods. These tell a lot about you. So here's where your, um, your prize comes in. So if you can shout out, well, you got to read, uh, I don't know how this works, three things in a row about you that you can tell everybody, but you have to be really loud. I will throw blue peeps to you. Okay, real loud. Stand up, though. And you like to what? Swim? swim? Okay, can you catch this? Okay, maybe not, because I'm not a good thrower. Okay, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to choose some. LJ, what, tell me three things. Stand up. Nice. Video games, TV, and he's a Christian. Here you go, LJ. And he can catch. Awesome. Well, and I threw a little bit better than I did to you, and I'm really sorry. Okay, um, what if these things that you just described, though, were taken away from you? Who would you be? No sports, no hobbies, no video games, no family, no friends. You would still be somebody and have an identity that is uniquely yours. This is the distinction between a secure person and an insecure person. So a secure person is one who places his or her trust in things that cannot be taken away from you, which are eternal things, or an eternal person, God. But an insecure person will place their confidence or trust in things that can be taken away, things that can be broken and ruined like temporal things of this world, right? I have, I have been an insecure person at times when I place my confidence and my trust in other people's opinion of me. That makes me very, very insecure. I remember when I was in fifth grade and I rode the bus and Amy and Karen sat together and talked about me. And my, I still feel this in my stomach sometimes. I'm like, ooh, that didn't feel very good. But you know what I wish? I wish somebody would have come alongside me and said, you know what, Carissa, your security and your identity and your worth is not based on Amy and Karen's opinion of you. It's actually based on Jesus Christ and you're accepted in him and he loves you and his opinion never changes about you. And so my security as a fifth grade girl on that bus could have been a lot better if I was reminded and if I kept telling myself the truth that my security and my worth is not in anyone else's opinion of me, but it's in Jesus Christ alone. So two things I want you to understand today um, as I talk fast in about 10, I have 10 more minutes. One is who is God and who are you? You will always, always be secure when you know who you are in relationship to who God is not in relation to what others think about you or the girl who sits next to you or the guy across the room from you or even your parents' approval of you. God's opinion is what matters most about you. So who is God? Genesis 1.1. If you want to say this with me, you can. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That means he's creator and we're not. He is perfect and good. He doesn't make mistakes. He has always existed, and he knows what's best. So who are you? You are made in God's image. Genesis 1, 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God chose to create you. He even chose your gender. You don't get to choose that. God is creator. In a world and a culture that has put everyone's opinion higher than God's, we must know and stand firm on the truth that God is creator, and he knows what's best for me and you. He doesn't make mistakes. So in this culture where people say, I can choose to be a different gender, or I can choose to live how I want to live, 
then what you're saying is, I am actually making decisions for myself without acknowledging that God is creator and he does not make mistakes. When he made you, he did not make a mistake. And so he made you and he formed you to reflect him in the specific role that he has for you. So your life will be safest and most secure when you trust how much God loves you. And I remember singing all three songs this morning that really emphasize God's love for you and that he does what's best for you. Even the difficult things, they're best for you so that you look like Christ. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, all things, all people, were created by him and for him. Did you know your life has value and worth today because God created you for his glory? Your life doesn't have value and worth based on how much stuff you have or the newest thing you just bought or how many friends you have or how many likes you get on Instagram or Facebook, if you guys are on that or how good you are at sports, or chess, or Rubik's Cube, or anything. Your life does not have value. Oh, I'm sorry. That is a sixth grade thing right now, isn't it? I'm so sorry. And everything else that you do, okay? Your life does not have value based on how good you are at things. It's, it's valuable because your identity is in Christ. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creature, a new person. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if you are in Christ today, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, it has changed everything about you today. So here's a quote from one of my favorite books. It says, being a Christian is neither a label nor an area of interest nor a matter of personal opinion. Being a Christian means that the most basic and fundamental thing about you has changed forever no longer your own, you are now defined by whose you are. You were dead in your sins, and now you are alive to God. God has the final word over your identity. I love this quote. I shared this with the volleyball girls that I got to coach in, um, uh, let's see, 8th through 10th grade this, this last year, um, this last season. I always told them, I said, you are not who you think you are. You are not who others say you are. You are who God knows you are. Can you guys try to say that with me? It's really good. You are not who you think you are. You are not who others say you are. You are who God knows you are. Isn't that great? Like, God knows who you are, and sometimes we're even deceived in our own mind when we say things about ourselves that isn't pleasing to the Lord. Or we listen to other people and what they say about us, and it makes us so insecure. But really, we need to know that we are who God says we are. How many of you have seen the movie Overcomer? Okay, I just sent a clip to Mrs. Cox, and she's going to send it to your teachers. And you can watch this sometime, whenever they say. But there's this clip in there. Do you guys remember this? Matt, do you remember this? When she walks into the room, and she has just become a Christian. She just walks in and she says, okay, ask me, who am I? And she, everybody gets quiet. They're all trying out for the play. Do you remember that? They're trying out for this play. And everybody stops and they look at her. And you're going to see this clip in your room later on. But she goes on through Ephesians 1, and that's where I want us to turn. If you guys have your Bibles, let's go to Ephesians 1. And she is going to say over and over the things that she is, the true facts that she is as a new person, a new creature in Jesus Christ. All right, Ephesians 1. And what I would encourage you guys to do, if you are going to spend any time with Jesus uh, during the next couple days, I would, on your own, I would look at Ephesians 1. And I would try to circle these words that Jesus says about Jesus 
you. Paul is actually writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's going to remind them of who they are in Christ. And when we read this, these same truths are about us, and they're for us if we are in Christ. All right, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So I circled the word chose. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption. And I circled that. To himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood. That means he bought us. He purchased us with his blood. And then I circled the word forgiveness, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Then I've sealed, a, I've, I've sealed, I've circled a couple more words below about an inheritance that we have and that we're sealed with his spirit. Wow, that's so awesome. If you guys could read that and circle it and then just start your day by thanking God for the new identity you have in Christ and all the blessings you have in his in him, I think that that would start your day a little bit differently than rolling out of bed and maybe being, you know, a little grumpy or complaining, but we would be so thankful and secure because we know who we are in Christ. All right, when your identity is in the one who created you, it will change your whole perspective. That's a quote that you'll see on the movie Overcomer. He says, when your identity is in the one who created you, it will change your whole perspective. Something or someone will have first place in your life. What if you allowed Jesus Christ and his opinion of you to define you today? Wow, like I would be so, I would, I'm going to have a really good day when I realize that I am in Christ and people's opinions of me, they're going to change, right? They're going to change. I cannot keep living my life based on that, I need to look to Jesus and know how secure I am in his opinion of me as my creator, God. All right, I'm almost done. Um, here's an example of one of a person, though, who might forget, okay, who might forget that their identity is in Christ and they have become self-focused. And I know that's really easy, right? We forget that our identity is in Jesus. Maybe then we would complain that we're bored, or we talk back, or we gossip. Am I comparing myself to other girls who have more friends or are prettier or have better stuff than I do? Or am I comparing myself to the boys who are faster or win the games or get better grades? Am I holding on to bitterness because someone doesn't want to be my friend anymore? That's me forgetting that my identity is in Jesus. I look to others and I compare to others. But here's the life of my day, even as an old lady, when I live for the glory of God, realizing that my identity is in him and my life is for Jesus. I would say this to God in the morning. I thank you, God, that I have some quiet moments today. I'm not bored. I'm actually not bored. Help me to spend time with you today for your glory. Thank you for my teachers. Help me to obey my parents as well. Help me to live a life that shows that you created me to image you. Oh, Lord, the other girls are so pretty. They have a lot of friends. And I praise you that you made them in your image. And you gave my friend an identity that is yours, too. So I'm not going to compare to her and hate her. I'm actually going to praise God for her. Thank you for the value I have in you and not in others' opinions. Thank you that you have the final word over my identity and life. If I were a guy in your classes, I would say, thank you for the boys in my class who are fast. You made them in your image, and you want them to do their best, and you help them be successful, even if I'm the one who lost. I'm actually going to say, I'm not going to compare to them. I'm going to thank God for them. See how we can view other people in relation to our creator God? So how we view ourselves should always be in relation to our creator, God. Or Lord, I'm thankful for opportunities to forgive others. I don't want to talk about them. I don't want to gossip today. They're made in your image even when they hurt me or they talk about me. Help me to love people for your glory. 
So we are to be glory givers, not glory receivers. We are to be worshipers. We shouldn't desire to be the ones who are worshiped. And then I have one last quote for you, and then I'll close in prayer. Be assured, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, that the one whose so-called opinion matters most has the decisive word on your identity. When you hear the expectations that others have of you, you're free to consider them in light of God's truth. There is ultimately no threat to your personhood, dignity, or worth, because the God who created all things, including you, does not have debatable opinions. His opinions never change on you, because he sees you the way he sees his son, Jesus. Who you are in Christ never changes, and it's not threatened by others. God is the one whose name is I am who I am. He says, fear not, I have called you by name. You are mine. My prayer is that we live in the reality that God writes our story. He gives it worth and value, not based on what we do, not based on how successful we are, but based on who he is. Okay? So I hope that would encourage you today. If you guys remember anything at all, read Ephesians 1. That's going to be the most impactful thing for you. Over your spring break, try to read Ephesians 1. Try to memorize portions of it. Circle words that show you how much you have in Christ, and I think it would make you a very secure person. All right, let's go ahead and pray, and then I think you're dismissed. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this opportunity. Thank you for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in this school. Lord Jesus, I pray that our identity would be just so secure in you and that we would realize that you are our creator God, you don't make mistakes, and you made us for a purpose, and that's to reflect your glory to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you.